Okay. Hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jennifer McNabb. Dr. McNabb did her undergrad studies in physics at the University of British Columbia. She went on to pursue a master's degree at the University of Western Ontario and the PhD at Oxford University. She then came to the Martino Center for her postdoc under the supervision of Professor Larry Weld, and then assumed her first faculty position in the radiology department at Stanford. Her lab at Stanford has made important contributions related to the design of diffusion and coding waveforms and image acquisition and reconstruction methods. She also contributed to the comparisons of MRI with tissue clearing, 3D histology, and key targeting approaches for neurosurgery and transcranial magnetic stimulation treatments. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have using the Q&A box or just raise your hand. Dr. McNabb, thank you so much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Or and Ishil, um, for this invitation. Um, you know, I have uh, such fond memories of my time at the Martino Center. It was very influential um, experience as, um, for me as a scientist. And uh, to all the trainees, uh, you've made an excellent choice in terms of uh, where to do where to do your training. So today I um, entitled this talk, Brain Diffusion MRI, Working All the Angles. Um, and that's because I would think that um, although my research has, has gone in lots of different directions, um, diffusion MRI and particularly in the brain is probably the still the most central central theme and the reason why I think diffusion MRI is a particularly powerful imaging modality or type of contrast for MRI is because it lets us um, infer on um, tissue components that are at a microscopic level well below um, our achievable image resolution and it's often at the this this microscopic level that early stage disease manifests itself. And um, um, that's a really powerful thing to be able to, to detect. And so the, the general concept is just that patterns of water diffusion and tissue reflect the elements of the tissue microstructure, um, including um, lots of different components like membranes and macromolecules and fiber orientations. Um, and then by sensitizing the MRI signal to water diffusion, we can indirectly get at this information about the tissue microstructure. And um, the most common way to encode or sensitize your, your MRI pulse sequence to diffusion is to use two uh, magnetic gradients um, uh, that are of an equal and opposite effect when they're placed on opposite sides of the refocusing pulse and they cause a phase shift relative to the location of spins. And therefore, if they move due to diffusive displacements between the two gradients, um, they won't be fully rewound and therefore we'll have a signal attenuation that we can detect. And um, these types of images are used in many different ways in the clinic. Sometimes we're just interested in you know, the raw diffusion weighted images or an estimate of um, the diffusion coefficient, a map of the diffusion co parent diffusion coefficient. Um, sometimes we like to leverage this type of encoding to look at fiber orientations in the brain. If we encode along many different orientations, we can get an estimate of uh, the orientations of fibers and use these to infer on uh, long range fiber trajectories that connect different regions of the brain. And then there's also a lot of interest in using these types of diffusion uh, measures to look at different features of the microstructure beyond just fiber orientations, including um, the size and shapes of compartments and how densely they're packed and how they're arranged. So we're looking at expanding MRI, diffusion MRI um, capabilities in lots of different ways. Um, there's different elements of the pulse sequence you can look at. So there's the diffusion encoding waveform. Um, and then there's also the image encoding part um, and the reconstruction. Um, there's lots of work being done as particularly in the image, image reconstruction realm um, to eke out improvements using machine learning approaches. Um, because these are indirect measures, um, there's a lot of focus in diffusion imaging 
on trying to validate um, that we're sensitive to what we think we're sensitive to. And um, uh, there's many different ways to do this. So um, sometimes we're interested in comparing against histology, um, but more recently, you know, I've been really interested in certain retrospe retrospective patient studies um, that also lend themselves to validating some of the imaging methods um, and uh, also animal studies. Um, there's also advents in hardware that um, uh, can dramatically expand our capabilities and those feed into what we can do in terms of our pulse sequences and our image encoding because the hardware can dramatically improve our sensitivity. Um, and I think there was <laughs> one last one, um, visualization tools. So um, we do have a project that's expanded into um, um, a neural navigation and augmented reality neural navigation system for, for TMS, um, which represents um, some new ways to visualize some of the data we can get with diffusion imaging and um, use it for navigation purposes. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna start with, by talking a bit about um, the diffusion encoding waveforms. And um, conventional diffusion encoding, as I showed before, tends to use these gradients, which are often in the shape of a, a, a rect pulse and um, a code along one orientation at a time. And um, therefore, we can describe that diffusion encoding with a B vector that takes into account the area of those gradients and the, the timing between them. <clears throat> But more recently, people have been looking at encoding along more than one orientation at a time. So encoding, um, having two pairs of gradients along different orientations, um, or even three. And if these are orthogonal, then that's um, giving you a planar B tensor or a spherical B tensor. <clears throat> and this is something that slowly made its way from NMR to preclinical scanners and now clinical scanners. And a lot of the motivation behind this is our desire to resolve some of the signal ambiguities that we see with diffusion encoding. Um, we're sensitive to lots of different features of the tissue microstructure, but it's hard to tease out. Um, a lot of different changes in the tissue can result in the same sort of um, effect when it comes to what we can measure. So you can see here uh, two different voxels that have different components to them. This is a sim overly simplistic example um, to try to show how this, this could pan out. But the blue um, voxel has low dispersion um, and isotropic compartments combined with some isotropic compartments. Um, whereas we have another one which just has anisotropic compartments, but they're much more dispersed. And um, if we were to sample these voxels with our linear encoding, they would show up pretty similarly. Whereas with the planar encoding, we can start to disambiguate between the two of them. And so there, if you look at the double diffusion encoding, there's a couple of key parameters here. There's the time between them and also the angle between the two diffusion encoding gradients. Um, and then this is another example that just shows you when you have anisotropic components versus isotropic components, um, your signal difference between the orthogonal and parallel diffusion encoding for gradient pairs isn't going to be equal for the anisotropic components, but it will be for the isotropic components. So it's another way to build a little bit of intuition for, for how we're getting different information. Resolving um, some of these signal ambiguities, if you require multiple images then um, and vary the angle between the encoding pairs um, at long mixing times, that signal curve is going to reflect the shape um, of some of the subvoxel compartments. And again, you can see um, a difference here uh, with the red curve showing the evidence of the anisotropic compartments um, that um, isn't shown for the isotropic compartments. You get signal modulation. And then as you marry, vary that mixing time, you can also um, vary that, that modulation. <clears throat> so people have coined the phrase macroscopic versus microscopic um, diffusion anisotropy. Um, and this is just an example where um, A voxels here, A and B have the same macroscopic diffusion, 
um, but different microscopic diffusion, um, whereas A and C have the same microscopic diffusion, but different macroscopic diffusion. And there's different ways to um, model this type of data and generate parameter maps. Um, one way is to look at what they're calling microscopic fractional anisotropy. Um, and you're averaging over, basically averaging over many gradient orientations to remove those signal variations um, from the net anisotropy. So you can really focus in on the microscopic anisotropy. Um, and the thought here is just that this is going to give us um, more sensitivity to um, some of the changes in tissue, particularly in areas where there's a lot of um, dispersion of um, any of the anisotropic components, um, which might be masking some of the changes that are occurring in those, those areas. So people are excited about this because they um, think that it could be a good way to probe gray matter microstructure, um, which tends to be much less coherent. Um, I think it's also a really useful way to improve the sensitivity to axonal structure, just because you um, hopefully aren't as obscured by some of the dispersion effects, as I just said. And then there's also interest in, an interest in, you know, even using some of this information to guide tractography as people are interested in, um, you know, inputting microstructure um, information into some of the tractography algorithms to help make it more, more accurate or robust. Um, but there's some clear challenges in implementing multiple diffusion encodings on clinical scanners. Um, diffusion image already tends to be an SNR starved type of imaging where our contrast is based on attenuation of the signal and it takes um, quite a bit of time to play out those gradients and now we wanna play out two pairs of gradients. So one problem is that that can really push your echo time out. Um, another thing is that the initial sampling schemes proposed required quite a few acquisitions. Um, and um, then, you know, on clinical scanners, um, there's a much more limited gradient strength compared to um, um, the preclinical scanners, at least, at least conventionally. Um, and so one of the things um, my lab did when they first, we first started looking at this was to try to look at how we might be able to reduce the number of acquisitions without compromising that microscopic fractional anisotropy measurement. And so usually when you're doing that, you wanted some set of parallel and anti-parallel gradient pairs and some set of orthogonal um, gradient pairs. Um, and, uh, you know, you would, you would rotate those orthogonal gradient pairs around uh, encoding various encoding planes. And so the question was just how many, how many do we need? <laughs> and do we need as many as uh, were first proposed? Um, and so one thing we realized is really, I mean, as a blessing and a curse, but clinical scanners um, are sort of forced to operate in a low Q and long diffusion time regime, which means that um, those individual subvoxel tissue components can really be modeled as a Gaussian propagator. Um, and that means that, um, that uh, since the trace is rotationally invariant in plane, rotations aren't going to really add that much new information. Um, and so that's, this is an example of that where you see um, different in-plane rotations um, going down the columns um, where you don't see very much change in the image contrast. But as you go to different orthogonal encoding planes, you, you do you see some changes in contrast. And so we came up with um, our, our goal here was to come up with a fast five minute acquisition that we could deploy in the clinic. Um, and so um, we used this um, new, new benchmark to, to, to do that and um, had an opportunity to, to acquire some data, which was still limited in resolution because we had such a short time frame, but um, was, was pretty, pretty robust. Um, and uh, also had a chance then to look at some multiple sclerosis patients and look at areas where um, there were lesions um, that were somewhat obscured in the DTI because you would see dropouts in the FA and regions of crossing fibers that you could see a little bit more clearly with the, the microscopic FA and also some, um, some more varied contrast in some of the larger lesions. Um, and so this might not be the way to 
identify lesions, but it might be a way to characterize some of the some of the lesions in MS a little bit better. Um, and so then, um, the, sorry, uh, we looked also at um, the second challenge here, going <laughs> right to left, looking at the long echo time. And so it was um, other groups that um, very cleverly uh, realized and proposed this concept of more generalized diffusion encoding waveforms. Um, and so um, there was this um, sort of realization that we really don't have to stick to these rectangular pulses, but generalized waveforms provide sort of a framework for maximizing all available encoding time and also an opportunity to optimize more broadly for scanner specific hardware limitations, such as gradient heating and uh, duty cycle. Um, and we thought that was uh, really, really interesting. Um, and particularly for triple diffusion encoding, um, you can uh, have quite a, quite a significant benefit because um, you can play them all out on all axes simultaneously. Um, which will really dramatically reduce your 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 echo time for those types of encoding or allow you to encode a higher higher B value. Um, it's worth pointing out that this type of imaging seems to go by many, many different names. Um, and there are some nuances to some of these, but um, it can be, I always like to point it out because um, can be can be a bit confusing. But um, we, we were interested to try this out. And so um, we implemented some of these uh, waveforms on our, on our clinical scanner and then looked at trying to optimize for robustness against eddy currents um, using, using an optimization framework. And um, basically um, the, the interesting thing is that many different waveforms can generate the same diffusion contest contrast and so there's a fair bit of uh, flexibility in how you how you use that um, and uh, we used a pretty simple model of the eddy currents just as a convolution of the exponential decays um, and tried to enforce that the eddy currents were zero at the time that we wanted to start our, our readout and added this as a, an additional um, <clears throat> additional limit um, to uh, this, this optimization framework designed um, by Joland um, et al. And uh, we found, um, we've, we've, these are some examples of some of the waveforms that, that we designed um, that allow you to simultaneously null on different axes. You can choose to maybe just null on the axes where you get the most severe eddy currents um, and how much of a trade-off with echo time you're willing to make in terms of the eddy current nulling. Um, and then this is just an example of some of the reduction in eddy currents that we were able to get from, from that sequence. But <clears throat> I think uh, it's always interesting to start to generate um, a new type of contrast and um, also to pull some of these methods from, from preclinical imaging to the clinical scanner and uh, this is just an example of the top row, you see the fractional anisotropy maps, but the bottom is microscopic fractional anisotropy maps. And the red arrows are pointing at um, some of the areas where you see a drop in signal in the FA, where you see a more homogeneous uh, signal in, in the microscopic FA map, as we would expect. And um, we had a ch chance also to deploy this on our 7T human scanner and um, get it rolled into one of the scans that was deployed in a healthy aging study. Um, and uh, part of the hypothesis we had is just that this type of imaging might show us bigger changes in um, some of the, some of the uh, diffusion parameters um, relative to um, tissue changes that we were expecting in the brain compared to, compared to conventional diffusion tensor imaging. And so here um, we're looking in the cingulum at changes in mean diffusivity for um, a conventional tensors, the, the change that we see in the red um, relative to, um, they did a, some cognitive tests that scored them on their um, delayed memory recall. And um, 
both show some sort of a trend or a correlation, but we see much bigger changes when we're using the, um, the microscopic um, anisotropy approach. And so this really, I think, is quite exciting if it um, improves our sensitivity to some of the, the tissue changes that um, we, we're interested in characterizing. Um, so the, the last way to, to, to last sort of challenge here on clinical scanners is just the, the hardware limits. And, you know, when I left the Martino Center, I had to leave, leave probably the best diffusion imaging scanner at the time um, and uh, go, on my, go on my way. Um, but um, luckily there are some people working on um, some scanners on the GE side. And um, I'll talk a bit more about how we've deployed some of these methods um, on, on them. So uh, we had a chance to work with Tom Fu from GE, GE Research. And uh, he's designing this Magnus gradient, which is a, a head-only gradient. Um, and um, one of the things about, about this, this gradient is that it really pushed the slew um, more than some of the others. So you get a benefit both in your image encoding read it, readout as well as your diffusion encoding. And uh, we had an opportunity to, to deploy some of these, these um, isotropic encoding waveforms um, for microscopic FA measures on the Magnus gradient and get some even higher res um, images that um, I think also showed some really interesting contrast here in the cortex and um, in other areas of the image. There are a few artifacts from um, concomitant fields. We didn't have the concomitant field gradient correction in place at the time that we were there um, testing this out. Um, but really exciting to start to see some of these maps at higher spatial resolution. I think you know people have been really interested in using these techniques to look at the gray matter, but not a lot has been shown so far. And I think part of that has to do with just um, limitations in resolution and um, our inability to get really uh, intrinsic gray matter signal. Um, and so I think with uh, many of the hardware developments that are going on, this type of imaging will we'll start to see that and we'll start to really reap the benefits of um, looking in the gray matter as well. And then this is just an example of um, some of the, uh, the SNR boost um, we're getting from, from these scans on the Magnus gradient compared to um, the, the uh, scanner at the time, the 50 millitesla per meter gradients we were limited to on the, the, the clinical scanner. Well, um, since we were we had this Magnus gradient, we were trying to figure out what, what to do with it. Um, and it had such um, fast slew rates, we looked at um, doing some oscillating gradient waveforms as well, um, just because that's a type of diffusion encoding, another type of diffusion encoding that could really benefit from uh, the fast slew particularly. Um, and so we, we designed some waveforms and um, uh, we're interested to really push the, the frequency, go to a high encoding frequency with the oscillating gradients and high, both high frequency and high B value. Uh, we were able to acquire one shell at a low B value uh, of 458, um, but at a high, up to a high frequency at 96 Hertz. Um, at B1000, we were able to go to 60 Hertz and at uh, B2000, we went to 48 Hertz. <clears throat> um, and we also looked at how to really try to potentially incorporate some optimization of um, the, 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 the spectra in terms of minimizing side lobes um, for these, these waveforms and starting to look at how much of an effect that might have here. So these are showing um, the spectra for the, the, the zero and then um, as you go up in frequency to uh, step up in frequency to 96 Hertz. And um, the interesting thing with this is that you can start to look at some of the time dependent effects of diffusion. So as you're measuring it diffusion at different diffusion encoding times, um, you get different values and people are really interested in characterizing this curve in itself um, as a way to get at different information about the tissue. 
<clears throat> and so here's plots of um, both the time dependence or the frequency dependence of the kurtosis measures, um, which include the higher the higher B value data, and then also the the diffusion tensor values um, as you go up to almost 100, 100 hertz. <clears throat> and uh, we're also trying to look at um, just how this might change across different tracks in the brain. Um, and, you know, the different tracks have certain known properties in terms of having um, different, different degrees of myelination or axon diameters or packing density and whether we can take some of that a priori knowledge and see whether it shows a different um, different, a different uh, dependence on, on frequency. So um, I think the looking at the diffusion encoding waveforms, I've, I've been very interested in that just because um, I think uh, it's, it's a new contrast and there's a lot to, to explore. Um, but another way to expand our capabilities is really improve our, our image encoding um, and reconstruction. And uh, part of our work on this is really motivated by um, my longstanding interest in cortical fiber patterns um, and mapping those with diffusion MRI. Um, so conventionally, when um, for in vivo two millimeter acquisitions, you don't really see much in the way of uh, coherent cortical fiber patterns. Um, but during my, during my PhD, when I was scanning ex vivo brains, we really started to notice this. And um, then as some of the in vivo acquisitions got better, um, we could see it in vivo as well. So <clears throat> I used lots of things to try and, try and get down to one millimeter isotropic in vivo. vivo. Um, during my, during my postdoc at the Martino Center, I um, remember putting volunteers um, uh, into some of the baby coils um, and uh, really, um, really pushing some of the great sensitivity, particularly around the cortex. Um, we also scanned just a few slices and scanned for a really long time. Um, and um, although that wasn't a super clever acquisition, it um, allowed us to start to see see these types of patterns that are mostly radial and follow the cortical folds really closely. Um, and so going to Stanford, we certainly were interested to, to replicate um, some of this capability um, as, as best we could on some of the different scanners. And you can do some little tweaks to <clears throat> just, again, use all your encoding time as, as effective as possible. Um, but I also was very interested um, from a lot of work from the Martino Center that was focused on the echo planar time resolved imaging, just because a big part of the, the cortical measurements is having um, uh, distortion, uh, really reducing your distortions. Um, so we would often rely on in plane acceleration factors of three um, to be able to, to get sufficient mitigation of the distortions to be able to see, see those effects reliable, reliably. And so um, this was very compelling to have essentially distortion-free images. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> the initial EPT EPTI implementation um, was great for multi-contrast relaxometry imaging, but the way it was laid out in terms of a case-based trajectory didn't really lend itself to any sort of self-navigation. And then there was this um, great work by, by Cowen and others on the propeller EPTI um, that uh, um, was a very impressive um, implementation that did allow self-navigated uh, diffusion imaging using this non-cartesian approach. Um, but I had a, a postdoc who was interested to see um, sort of a, a more minimalistic approach to this um, in some ways. Um, he was interested in keeping with a Cartesian trajectory um, and doing what he called self-navigated Cartesian-based EPTI, um, where you can see he modified the trajectory here along KT, um, essentially with just a rewinding gradient um, that ensured that we always captured enough of the central case space to be able to, to get a navigator out of that. Um, and so this um, hit a pipeline that, that got his phase match navigator and then also 
um, his compact gra grappa kernel um, and uh, started to show some nice results um, from, from this approach having um, reduced, you can zoom in on some reduced distortions, particularly at the front of the brain. Um, and uh, also if you're looking down <clears throat> in the low, lower in the brain where we typically have a lot of distortions, we could see some nice, nice improvements there as well. And um, here just pointing out um, certain features um, close to the brainstem that you could see see better um, with the EPTI. Um, so I think I think those um, types of approaches are also uh, really exciting for for starting to go after some of that cortical gray matter um, um, microstructure that we're so interested in. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a bit about um, some of the the validation. Um, <clears throat> so. We have, we have looked a lot at validation through histology um, in the past, um, but today I'm going to talk um, a bit more about um, some of the validation we're doing um, in other ways. So um, I've always thought it would be useful <laughs> to have um, some of these animal studies uh, that are um, nice complements to the human work that we're doing, um, but it really requires finding those, those golden collaborators um, who have the mutual interests and uh, the, the lab um, infrastructure to do these types of studies. Um, and so we've recently connected um, with, with Juliet Knowles um, lab at Stanford and she's a pediatric neurologist, a physician scientist who's really interested in um, the progression of epilepsy and uh, was looking at um, a new model of absence seizures in a mouse model. And, um, you know, they would do these very painstaking um, electron microscopy measurements to look at the axon diameters and the myelination, and estimate the G ratios. Um, <clears throat> but of course they can only look at very small regions of tissue and they have to sacrifice the animals at different time points um, to be able to look at this. Um, and then they were also doing histology, looking at different sorts of um, um, uh, oligodendrocyte um, propagators and uh, you know, features that were relevant to the myelination process. And they have pretty clear hypotheses here about um, abnormal um, or maladaptive myelination that can occur as the seizures start to propagate. Basically the, the seizures themselves can cause some structural changes that then cause more and more seizures to, to develop and the frequency of seizures gradually in, increases. And um, I think she, um, I was presenting a talk at one of the neuroscience um, uh, retreats at Stanford and uh, <clears throat> Luckily, this group started to see that MRI was starting to get close to some of the measures they were interested in with all the benefits that we have with MRI, which is whole brain mapping and longitudinal measures. Um, and um, so um, from our perspective, it was great to have a chance to work with them because we're also interested to try to validate um, any of the techniques that we're, we're trying to build up. And so to be able to do the imaging and then compare against their histology um, is, is a, a fantastic opportunity. And so Gustavo Chow, a, a graduate student in my group, has uh, been building up some of these methods to look at um, this MOS model and the comparisons with the um, electron microscopy. And uh, he's been looking at both diffusion and also um, quantitative T1 and quantitative T2. And, uh, quantitative um, magnet magnetization transfer um, estimates. And uh, we've been starting to um, build up some, some data that does start to show some of the same trends that they're seeing with the electron microscopy um, with some of these estimates of G ratio from the diffusion and um, quantitative, other quantitative measures that are combined. And uh, so this is um, really, an, I think, a new, exciting, ongoing area of work. And um, the ultimate goal is to also be working on implementing these methods in the clinic and 
um, working um, in the pediatric epilepsy population. Another animal study um, here is uh, some ex vivo scans that we had the opportunity to do. Karen Harush is, um, started up a marmoset lab at Stanford recently, and um, <clears throat> we had the opportunity to scan a newborn who um, unfortunately passed away really shortly after death, but we were able to preserve the brain um, and then also look at an adult brain and have some matched um, really nice high quality match data sets, uh, DTI data sets. And um, these were starting to use to look at um, some, some features of neurodevelopment. There's certain cortical areas <clears throat> that are known to develop faster um, than others. And so you'd expect uh, more of a difference. Um, here we're showing in the a24 area, a much bigger differentiator between the adults and the baby in terms of the FA values compared to area 25. Um, and so um, that's also a, um, a compelling study that's teaching us a lot. And I'm learning why marmoset brains are um, so valuable in neuroscience just because they, they don't have any folds. And so they're um, in some ways much simpler to uh, study and look at. Um, Next, I also want to talk about um, some neurosurgical targeting um, and some patient studies. Um, now, in the past, I've often thought about you develop diffusion methods and you want to validate them and then you apply them in patients and test them out. But I'm starting to realize more and more that there's a lot of opportunities to integrate some of your imaging um, with patient studies and look at them retrospectively and get a lot of validation or information um, really relevant clinical information um, based on either, you know, the patient's response to the treatment um, relative to what, what the imaging says. Um, and one of the ways in which uh, we most closely interact with the clinic has to do with neurosurgical targeting. Um, there's lots of expanding treatments for deep brain stimulation, and there's a thriving MR-guided focused ultrasound program at Stanford. And uh, for each of the new types of treatments um, that they're looking to treat with these uh, therapies, there's always a question of where should they intervene and how should they find that location. And uh, so we've had an opportunity to work um, with some of these groups. And um, here's an example where um, Casey Halpern, um, a neurosurgeon, um, we were working with at Stanford, who's now um, left to go to Penn, sadly, but um, <clears throat> he was really interested in the nucleus accumbens um, to treat um, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, with DBS and um, was compelled by the fact that there were animal studies that showed that different parts of the nucleus accumbens um, had very different, had connections with very different parts of the brain. And so he was really interested whether tractography could be used to segment these, um, these different regions of the nucleus accumbens, um, which he thought was really important for, for their targeting purposes. Um, and so you can see here an example where you co-register the location of their electrodes and you have data on how the patient reacted here. They've scaled their anxiety and mood when they stimulated using these different electrodes, which are in different regions. Um, and then we can go and correlate those locations with what the tractography segmentation of the nucleus accumbens says and see that indeed they had um, a very different response on the top when the electrodes appeared to be in different uh, segments of the nucleus accumbens um, compared to the bottom where they both seem to be in the more uh, inferior part of it. So um, this is a, a, another, another sort of way to start to get at um, some sort of validation for some of the, the targeting approaches. There is also this great work that Chiwan was a part of uh, when he was at my lab at Stanford, where um, they're very interested in locating the region in the thalamus um, where um, they want to ablate with focused ultrasound to treat essential tremor. And they were particularly interested in identify the motor, the hand motor representation within the thalamus. And so we were trying to do that by running these tracks between the hand motor, hand knob area 
and the thalamus and looking where the majority of those streamlines seem to land. Um, and then we could retrospectively look at where they actually put the lesion and look at where the tractography said that they should have put the lesion um, and see whether the patients um, who had their lesion in the place where the tractography suggested it should be ended up having a better, a better outcome. Um, and so I think this is, you know, I'm always somewhat amazed when anything like this seems to line up, but um, we do indeed see that in some of these cases, um, for example, um, I guess P4 and uh, say P6 um, had, had much better, better outcomes here. Um, you can see in terms of the, the change in their score, um, their clinical score <clears throat> relative to um, um, the number of streamlines that were found to overlap with that, that lesion, lesion area. This work's continued to, to progress. And so another thought was to look at not just um, this track of, that they believe they're trying to target, the dentatorubrothalamic track, um, which is um, an ascending track that's involved in initiation planning and timing of movement, but also some of the neighboring tracks that they believe they do not want to hit, which could also be useful for helping to guide them um, in terms of no-go regions, so the pyramidal track. Um, and also the medial lemniscus, um, which is involved in sensory. And um, so Christian Toller did some nice work building on this where he mapped all of these relative to uh, where, the, where the lesion was. Um, and then the amazing thing is we had this follow-up data. Um, and so he was able to look at um, imaging data <clears throat> after um, 12 months after the treatment. And the idea was to see whether um, before um, and after treatment, there was a significant change in some of these DTI measures. And the idea is that we would think that those patients who did well would have, you know, a significant change in the track of interest and ideally not a, not a change in um, the, the other tracks, um, which should be controls. Um, and for the most part, that is um, what we saw. Um, there was a significant change in the pyramidal track in FA, um, and we think that might be due to the fact that you can't totally disambiguate those tracks along certain parts of their trajectory because they run very, very closely together. Um, but we did, it, it did see the trend that we expected. Um, there's also a, a lot of focus now on combining this with other modalities, and Gary Glover's group is working on a lot of uh, functional um, MRI methods to target the same region. And we really think that by building up this toolkit and um, understanding how the different measures relate to each other spatially, um, that um, this will help these surgeries really get the most accurate targeting possible. Another, another example that I'm really excited about that we're starting to get more involved in um, is um, combining tractography and some stereo EEG measures. So stereo EEG is um, being used more and more commonly in epilepsy patients. Um, it's a procedure where they insert multiple um, depth electrodes across the brain um, in an attempt to map the seizure onset zone and seizure propagation. And um, to really some of these patients who don't respond to medication, um, the they can benefit a lot from surgery, but they really need to know where that seizure onset zone is. And the lesions can be quite subtle, as you see in this example here where the arrows are pointing, um, but sometimes they can't even really be, be seen at all. So there's plenty of work to be done on the imaging side, um, but it's also amazing data that they're acquiring in many, many people. Um, and um, part of it is that these procedures have become roboticized and much safer. Um, and so um, there's just, just, just a lot of data there. And I think that some of the diffusion mapping can play a role in helping them to guide where to place the deep brain, um, the, the depth electrodes, but also help interpret some of the stereo EG results that they get the, from the procedure. Um, <clears throat> and so we've started looking at you know, some of these patients where we acquire the tractography data before the procedure, and then we get the locations of where all the electrodes were, and um, we can look at some of these um, 
EEG results. And particularly we focused in when there are electrodes that seem to be positioned within different locations along the same track. Um, and we can start to look at the EEG measures. And um, I think it would just be really, um, these are three examples where we have a track with um, two electrodes intersecting at various points. But um, it's really compelling just to be able to get this type of data in humans and start to look at features of the track or the tissue microstructure properties of the track and some of the functional measures of the EEG. Um, and then on the right here, we're just showing, you know, there's lots of uh, development going on quite rapidly about how to look at some of these data and how to integrate it. But um, this is just a tractography based connectivity matrix that's attempting to, to map from every electrode, every stereo EEG electrode to every other electrode. Okay, lastly, um, I wanted to mention um, another targeting project um, that I alluded to in the beginning that has to do with helping to guide transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, which is a treatment for depression. And so this is an important treatment option for many depression patients. Um, and uh, generally they're looking to stimulate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that are thought to be responsible for mood and behavior. Um, but the treatment really depends on the ability to, you know, accurate stimulation intensity calibration and coil positioning. Um, and it seems like um, targeting accuracy you know, got better as um, clearly the, the setup got uh, slower and, and more complex. Um, so the simplest and speediest way that many, many clinical treatment centers use is still just to find the motor cortex and then move five centimeters anterior and start stimulating. Um, but there's also slightly more sophisticated measures um, that rely on some scope measurements that help take into account that people's heads are different sizes. And then there's the full-on image guided neural navigation where you can um, use either a brain atlas or the individual's individual um, MRI data to um, track the location and relate it to features on their, their head um, to, get, to get a more accurate um, estimate of where to stimulate. <laughs> um, and so we saw an opportunity here to um, develop um, a neural navigation system that took advantage of some of these um, head mounted um, mixed reality displays that um, could allow um, potentially to do an image guided neural navigation, but have all the relevant information you need for the procedure right, um, right um, visualized through that headset. So you could project um, imaging data or e-field modeling data um, and have it um, display and change in real time as you move the location of the um, TMS coil, or you could make it really, really simple and just show um, a representation, a virtual representation of the coil, and the user just lines up the, um, the real TMS coil with that virtual representation and away they, away they go. Um, and so we had an R21 that um, allowed us to make some progress on some initial systems. And one of the great things is it was an excuse to work with Oppo again, and he's been uh, a really big supporter and um, also helping us to um, in in integrate some of his um, amazing TMS modeling uh, work into this, into this system. So hopefully that will be um, something that continues, continues as well. Okay, so um, I didn't talk about everything here, but um, this is um, sort of the different, different flavors um, of diffusion imaging and ways in which we're working to expand capabilities. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to have a chance to present this to you. And um, thank you for, for joining today. Um, uh, it's an amazing team that, uh, that did all of this work, current and former group members and uh, many amazing collaborators. Um, and of course, thank you to all the, the funding sources. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor McNabb, for this great talk. And we now move to the Q&A phase. Yeah, I'd just like to remind the audience to, to either use the chat, Q&A box, or raise your hand. And we have the first question coming from Bruce. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad I somehow jumped the queue. So sorry for everybody else. Uh, Jen, that was a fantastic. Um, no, uh, no surprise that uh, you've uh, proven the point that there uh, can be life after Martino's. Uh, you've uh, <laughs> done a brilliant job uh, of it, and and the work is great. Uh, many, many potential uh, questions that come from it, but one that struck me uh, came towards the end of your talk when you were uh, talking about uh, electrophysiological measurements uh, from the stereo EEG, where you kind of intersect a single track. Uh, are you able to, uh, you know, make measurements, say, of uh, uh, conduction velocities or other uh, um, uh, uh, elements uh, directly related to the electrophysiology and then connect that to what you can measure tractographically uh, uh, in terms of the microstructure of those tracks and, and begin to build some element of this, uh, you know, kind of cross validation sure function. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what came to mind when I first uh, sort of saw this opportunity. <laughs> um, no you know, we're not quite, we're not quite there yet, but they definitely like to look at features like time to first peak and um, you know different things that do start to get at conduction velocity. I'm trying to learn a lot about EEG measures, <laughs> um, but uh, you yeah, know there. It I might think be there phase, are certain... might be phase measures in, in oscillatory things, and that of course can also be a function of the uh, of the frequency of the oscillatory behavior you're looking at. You know, the, a bunch of different ways, but it's a fantastic opportunity to get these real detailed electrophysiologic measures and then related to the microstructural measures that you can get, you know, uh, along with it. It's amazing. No, it's, 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 it's amazing data. Um, and I think more and more people are, are looking into this to test their own neuroscience hypotheses about a number of things. I mean, there's so many elements to it. There's the, you know, from the epilepsy side, they certainly want to map the seizure propagation and, you know, they'd love to see some sort of a semblance of what you know, that network might actually look like, or, um, you know, we also could think that maybe from our animal studies, we can see that um, we see changes in the microstructure relative to the seizures. And so that might be a way to also to pick out what some of the relevant tracks in that seizure propagation network are. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, I think there's just a lot of interest in getting the, you know, people have very specific questions about, um, you know, just just various points of connectivity that relate to various conditions. And so, you know, they feel like there's a lot of studies going on on these patients while they're in there getting their phase two. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's really interesting. And they, you know, it's just um, for us, I see it as, I'm always looking at sort of the more, you know, basic imaging questions that we can tease out from this from this data, um, so. Yeah, very data rich space, uh, beautiful uh, beautiful work and, and great talk overall. Thanks for, uh, for your willingness to uh, chat with us. Thanks, thanks for tuning in, Bruce. <laughs> Next question from Larry. Hey, uh, great to see you again. Um, great to catch up on everything. It sounds like you've been having fun. Um, yeah, I just was wondering if you had any trouble with magnetophosphines. And when you were operating the Magnus gradient in the sort of 20 to 30 Hertz range. Um, I mean, we, we haven't is a simple really? answer. Um, we scan, you know, they're still acquiring data for us <laughs> over at GE research. Uh, we're still working with them actively, but neither the, you know, there were two visits there to acquire data. And um, now that we're still acquiring a lot of this data and um, no, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, would you expect that um, in that range? You have reason to believe that. <laughs> well, that's where the retina is maximally sensitive, and it's very different frequency behavior from peripheral nerves. And uh, you know, we saw them on the connectome, and um, you know, but uh, you know, two, they're they're pretty strongly peaked around twenty five hertz. So. And you know, around 100 millitesla, but it depends on the concomitant fields and what they happen to be in the retina. But I was just wondering. And is, is it mostly along? It. Is it mostly um, along X? Since you, I mean, it also has to do with whether your eyes can be pretty close to ice or center, right? Doesn't it? Yeah, or... yeah. Where the eyes are uh, certainly matters a lot, and we we change that on the connectome. And actually, the the Cardiff people just. Uh, 
I think it's it's either just published or it's on online view, uh, looking at phosphine thresholds and their connectome, and uh, yeah, it, it you know like I said, it depends on the total field and the, the direction too because the retina is planar. But uh, anyway, yeah, I was just wondering. We're starting to looking at it in a little more detail. And there's not a lot of data out there on it. So, so let me know if you end up seeing any. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And last question from Susie. Hi, Susie. Hi, Jen. I'm here actually with Brian Edla. We have oh, a question. Hey. <laughs> um, I was really interested in the TMS work that you're doing. Um, what kinds of measures are you looking at with the sort of TMS induced um, changes in the brain. Are you interested in looking at microstructure after sort of doing TMS yeah. in these patients? You know, so that's been much yeah. more of a, um, you know, so far it's been more geared towards just getting a system that's, you know, more clinically feasible for more accurate targeting. So mostly trying to focus on just, can we um, get better outcomes for treating depression? Um, um, or other, or just even simpler than that, looking at, you know, tracking whether the coil is actually held at a more, you know, placed at a more reliable position for each session um, and uh, things, things like that, just how, how consistent um, and accurate the, the targeting can be and whether that relates to better, better outcomes, which is, has been part of the challenges because I don't think it's been really well documented and um, the FDA, approved procedure doesn't require image-based neural navigation. So um, there's some question about whether it's really needed and, and yet it still seems, um, seems, seems like it should offer <laughs> benefit and be important. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think the tools that you're developing to try to improve the consistency of the uh, sort of targeting and delivery will definitely be, I think, helpful toward that end. Um, I think Brian just had a question also. How do you? Congratulations. <laughs> Great talk, Jen. Great uh, thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to squeeze in one last question from Bruce Jenkins. Oh, hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. And of course, you covered so many uh, different areas. You know, uh, any one of them may not have gone into the depth that was uh, that, that could have that you could have gone into. So one of the things I was curious about really was the machine learning, um, use of machine learning, maybe deep learning uh, patterns to take, for instance, uh, certain tracks where you, you might desire contrast and then design gradient waveforms specifically for that particular track or that particular type of contrast. Have you, have you, have you guys explored that at all in any depth? We, we have not. Um, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea idea um, to try and try and optimize it for, I, you know, I wonder whether so far I feel like we detect pretty subtle differences in uh, the microstructure, but then maybe that's a perfect area for the machine learning to, to pick that up. <laughs> um, so that's, 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 a, that's an interesting thought. We have, we have not focused on that so far. Yeah, because it seems like um, when you're designing these complicated gradient waveforms that maybe, um, uh, you know, something, uh, an algorithm like that would do a better job than a human at designing a specific uh, waveform, you know. To, to target sensitivity to a particular microstructure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's very compelling. Um, I mean, I guess the thing we're fighting against is uh, uh, sometimes people wanting more general acquisitions. <laughs> it's always that trade-off, I guess, between um, having something that's some more tailored versus, uh, more broadly applicable, but, um, that's, that's, no, I think that's, I, I'm very interested in machine learning applications for, um, tailoring the acquisition. Um, I think the acquisition is always sort of looking at, um, different ways to encode, um, is probably more where my heart is in terms of pursuing some of these different areas, but, um, yeah. Great. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thanks to all the panelists and thank you so much again, Professor McNabb for this great talk and we hope to see you sometime soon at the center. Thank you.